The following is a conversation with Brad Seaman about the rationality of repentance. He is an associate professor of philosophy at Taylor University. Do you think repentance is rational? Let me doubt it. Certainly not in all the cases, but to the extent to which we have been able to modify our environment faster than our genetics have been able to adapt to it, I would say that repentance is useful as a system of giving feedback of something you've done wrongly in the past, but it doesn't necessarily need to be rational or correctly adapted to our current situation. When you face a situation that resembles something of your past in which you've been shown to have failed, you feel that there's something going on and that's exactly repentance telling you, hey, don't fail again in the same in the same thing. You should do something else. And that's exactly what I would say is repentance. For example, you can see that people here are trying to maximize something, let's say human flourishing, and what should they do in order to maximize it? I think getting feedback is useful. Okay. But once you are deep into your life and you are just overwhelmed by all the, all the feelings, you might not be able to see it as rationally. And so you might feel the repentance and the feelings that might not be rational in all the cases. That's okay. my my stand. Okay. What what are you meaning by repentance here? I'm I'm not sure we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> okay. There's there's a differentiation between regret and repentance. And I think that you regret something when you cannot go back and repair whatever failure you've made. Okay. And you have repentance of something when you've made a bad investment or whatever has been the thing you've made wrongly, but you are still able to recuperate. You haven't invested all your life. You had a kid, you raised it wrongly. That's You're going to go back and raise it correctly, like, you know? Okay. You might have some kind of regret in that situation. Yeah. And not repentance. When I think of repentance, I think of being aware that you've done something poorly, you've done something wrong. Not just have mere regret or remorse, like you wish you had done something differently, but kind of owning what you have done that's wrong and saying, okay, I understand that it was legitimately, in fact, wrong. And I should back out of it and do something different. I think of it as involving more something like remorse or regret. I think of those as involving more just kind of wishing you hadn't done something or maybe hadn't gotten caught. <laughs> But isn't remorse attached to religion? I think of I think of repentance is more basic for religion. So so for example, You look at the New Testament, you look at Jesus, and the, the Greek word that gets in English translated as repent is actually, in Greek, it is metanoia. So it's one Greek word, but it has two parts. So meta, change. In English, we talk about a metamorphosis. So you have you have a better butterfly or a, a caterpillar, and it, it goes into its chrysalis and it liquefies and then comes out uh, a butterfly and that's a complete change of form so meta change morphosis form uh, but here with the greek word for repentance in the new testament it's meta change but then the the word noia is referring to mind so that our, our mind is re is rearranged is changed around and so I think of that as running much deeper than remorse or regret, but something where you say, I'm not only wishing that I hadn't gotten caught or wishing that I maybe done something different, but I'm backing out of it and saying, I was, I was wrong with that. And my mind needs to be rearranged. I need, I need to have my mind changed around. My priorities, my values need to be changed. So I think of repentance as running much deeper than remorse. And that I think, for example, when Jesus is talking about 
about repentance, he's talking about that, that remorse is not not what he's wanting. So the opening words of the, the book of Mark, for example, the kingdom of God is Anglican. It's like the, the Greek there is like it's a lion ready to pounce on you. And the kingdom of God is is very, very near. And then he says, repent and believe the good news, metanoia and believe the good news. So I, th- I don't think remorse captures quite the sense of what Jesus was talking about, for example, with repentance. Remorse, I think of as more wishing you hadn't gotten caught. <laughs> and that's a different thing. So, But when you're trying to get to avoid getting caught, you're trying to trick the system. Yeah. You're trying to fool someone else. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no way you could have the highest of the standards in your own mm-hmm. assimilated mm-hmm. and at the same time be trying to fool someone else. Mm-hmm. I think whenever you are getting towards the perfection in moral terms as what Jesus represents, yeah. in the in the transition towards it, you stop trying to fool people. I mm-hmm. think there's there's mm-hmm. a sense of, mm-hmm. of truth mm-hmm. that right, you right, right. that you assume in yourself and you stop telling lies whenever you are transitioning towards perfection. Right, right. And maybe some of it then is more about that standard. I think that does capture something important, that it's more about internalizing that standard. So rather than merely being worried about the penalties, it's more about recognizing the standard is in fact right and wanting to internalize that so that one's actions change more from the inside out. You know, when I talk about this some with my students, I talk about it as... It's something that's going to grasp how you value things, how you measure things. So success or failure at the end of a day, at the end of raising your kids, you brought up, you know, kids and and having regret there. But this being something where, you know, how, what's that standard that you measure uh, success or failure by? And I think repentance really gets at internalizing that standard and saying, okay, I've really been almost measuring my life incorrectly and I need to bring a new measuring stick into how I measure whether I'm doing the right thing or the wrong thing. And so that's my tendency to to think of of that idea of repentance then as it compared to say something like remorse. Now now that you brought out the concept of failure versus success, my previous episode without you knowing it because there's no way you could know it (laughs) because it's not out yet mm. i haven't uploaded yet okay it's with patrick she's a friend of mine okay and we talked about the topic is basically what is failure and we try to to go through what would make you believe that you are achieving success or failure mm. whenever you are doing something and we talked about the the standard you you are using and whenever you are fulfilling it you have success it's such a coincidence that these two topics <laughs> are so correlated and we talked about maybe doing a podcast, a future episode about what repentance is and why it might not be rational from okay. a rush, from okay. an absolutely rational perspective, Okay, which it might not have. What, what would make, so, so help me see the issue here. So why would it, perhaps repentance not be rational? What's the issue there? I'm, I'm perhaps not seeing it yet. So, so yeah, crystallize that issue for me. Okay. When you've committed an action, you've made something, and you've realized that that action didn't deal lead to whatever is considered by yourself a success in your moral standard, you got some feedback of, this is not how you should be doing this. And so you are incentivized in some way. I would argue that biologically we've evolved towards penalizing things that are negative for the surviving of the species. For example, if you burn your hand, you will raise your hand instantly. And with many other things, feelings with people, if you feel like someone is not treating you right, you are going to try to get away from that situation. There's a thousand examples that we could talk about, but the basic thing is that you get feedback whenever you feel like what you've done previously is incorrect and has led to something suboptimal. So that feedback is felt by you with feelings. There's nothing else which, with which you could feel things apart from feelings. That's the whole point of consciousness. But how overwhelming regret tends to be hmm. is irrational from my point of view. Is it irrational? Yeah. Okay. I think that if we were 100% rational, like a robot, 
Yeah, right. You, you just have a function and you try to fulfill it in the best possible way. And you find different ways of doing it. And you take into account every bit of information you got, which is not the case with humans at all. But that would be the most rational way of approaching a problem that I could think of. And we're by no means doing it. We're just trying to do something in order to satisfy our instant feelings mm -hmm. in, in most mm -hmm. of the cases. Mm -hmm. And those long-term projects that we might have are not usually fulfilled by our genetic predispositions towards not focusing in what is going to lead to fulfillment in the long term. Mm -hmm. We're not, mm -hmm. We haven't been involved in, a, in an environment which promulgates those kind of investments. We're mm -hmm. more, more of a short-term biased mm -hmm. creature. Mm -hmm. We're biased mm -hmm. into the short term. So in my stance against what could be considered as regret is that we tend to feel it too deeply. We don't just feel of regret as a concept abstracted from ourselves, which just gives you some information that you shouldn't have done something in a way and you should do it in some other way. You might not get the positive feedback of this is the way of doing it, but you might get the negative feedback of this is not the way of doing it. So th that's also valuable and that's easier to get correct feedback if you're getting negative feedback than positive, but that's another topic. But the basic thing is that we as humans are not able to manage regret in most of the cases without being influenced by our feelings into doing suboptimal things. And so if we were rational, we would just take into account whatever we failed in the past and try to adapt our new circumstance and manage it with the new information we have, which is different from the information you got previously. That would be the best possible way of approaching it, but we don't do it. And so I think that regret is not rational as long or in proportion to how ineffective you are in managing your future situations with the new information you have. If you have new information and you should objectively, you analyze someone and you know that this person committed this error and he already knows the solution to that error, but he fails again. Mm. Why does he step into the same rock again? Mm. Because we're humans, we're not perfect. And so this also th happens with drugs, with many biases. Sure. I've got a whole episode about the origin of all the biases and virtues. And I, the lack of virtue exists due to a lack of long-term sight mm -hmm. and an excessive short-term sight. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's my basically my thesis. And so whenever we're trying to avoid committing the same error, or we still commit it in a lot of cases due to the thing I told you, that we're not just seeing hard facts objectively and saying, this is the thing I made wrongly, I should do this. So you are not actually able to make the correct decision, but that's due to excessive feeling. We'll get quickly into some things that I don't know a whole lot about, but I've done a little bit of, a little bit of reading, uh, the role of emotions in epistemology. And there are a lot of interesting studies from what I understand. Again, I'm, I'm no expert here, but there are a lot of interesting studies on the role of emotion and rationality. Um, one of the things that I know that, that has been studied is when emotional parts of the brain are damaged, that that actually affects our ability to reason. So the reason I'm going to jump on one thing here that I'm, I'm, I'd want to challenge a little bit, like you talked about, you know, kind of the, the, the paragon of rationality is as like a robot that, you know, just sort of does only what's rational based on calculations. I think I'd want to push on that a little bit. I think I'd want to push on that and say that I, I don't think that that's what rationality is. I think, I think robots or computers are very good sort of calculating machines. They're very good at sort of ends mean calculations as it were, but I'm not, I'm not sure I'd want to reduce rationality to that. I think there's a very positive role for emotion and rationality while also at the same time recognizing what I would see as a very important point that you're making where I do think something like re regret can paralyze us, can 
overwhelm us. Indeed, I've, I've seen people that I think, you know, that, that happens in their lives and they get, they do get frozen. They do get irrational by an emotion that comes to, I would want to talk about maybe some of it is overwhelming, more fitting emotions, more appropriate emotions, emotions that, that lead toward health, lead toward a kind of rationality that is beyond just sort of calculating. I mean, I think of our, our closest friendships, our closest, my relationship with my wife. There's something there that's way, way beyond just sort of end mean type of rationality. You know, something like uh, uh, Jürgen Habermas talks about like, you know, uh, my German is horrible, uh, but something like Zweck rationality, you know, this, this ends mean reasoning. And Habermas is wanting to talk about communicative reason and the importance of something else than just sort of plotting my way toward, you know, the end that I want, but coordinating relationships, coordinating relationships in a way of trying to come to an understanding, for example. Now I have a lot of disagreements with Habermas on a lot of different things, but I think he's onto something, something right there. And something that, that I think, I think can maybe lead to a helpful way forward in connection with a topic like this, where again, I, I would want to, I would want to push away from computers being sort of the, the, you know, the, the, the high point of rationality and to say a lot of what I think rationality really involves it. It's it, in its human dimensions is you and I coordinating relationship with each other in a way that is beyond just sort of using each other as a, a means to an end, but that I am, uh, you know, I mean, this is Kant, right? So recognizing you as an end in yourself and trying to, trying to coordinate together with you as, you know, uh, on that level. And I think emotion is relevant there for that of, being able to appreciate, being able to put myself into your shoes, being able to imaginatively put myself in your place and understand what uh, what it's like to to walk a little bit in your shoes. And I think emotion is really helpful for that kind of thing. So maybe the answer, I would say, I'm a little bit talking off the top of my head. I'm just exploring here. It's, it's an interesting topic um, that I haven't thought about a whole lot. I wonder if some of the way forward there in the place of paralysis by an excess of regret or some other emotion, uh, negative emotion grief uh, is, yeah. Yeah. I mean, finding, finding, finding grace for sure. I don't know. Um, grief, grief. Okay. Grief. Yes. You know, being paralyzed by grief uh, and you can watch that happen. And, you know, you, you think about that. I mean, that's a great example. Uh, we just were watching a movie the other night. We invited students to watch a movie called Just Mercy. Fantastic movie about, have you seen that? I remember it. Bri Brian Stevenson is, uh, is a Christian man back in the United States, black man, studied, uh, studied law at Harvard, uh, took that and, and worked with death row prisoners. Um, trying to bring justice because apparently, apparently about one in 10 death row prisoners in the United States is truly actually innocent, which is a horrific error rate for something like that. I mean, completely unacceptable. So it's just a movie about Brian Stevenson going into a situation like that and saying, what can I do to bring justice in here? And he wants to, he, he says, one of the things that Brian Stevenson says, he's famous for saying this, each of us is more than our worst mistake. Each of us is more than our worst mistake, which feeds into regret and having grace for yourself. I mean, one of my favorite uh, Christian authors is a guy by the name of Tim Keller. And he talks about the need to preach the gospel to ourselves, preach grace to ourselves in the midst of, you know, this thing does not define me. 
and finding a place from out of which to forgive ourselves, from out of which to be healed. I think that fits very well with the kind of thing that motivates Brian Stevenson's work to bring justice into hideously racially unjust situations. I would say bring more justice. Yeah, bring more justice. So what, why that distinction? And I've got one other thing I want to work back to with grief, but, but why, why do you say that? Because I think that the legal system of the U.S. is partially functional. Oh, yeah. Yes. The alternative would be absolute chaos. Yes, yes, yes. No, agreed. So agreed. they are probably doing more good than harm. And yeah. so trying to increase the, like, let's say it's 90% efficient, yeah. which is horrific. Right, right. 10% of the people being a false positive, yeah. that's horrific. Right, but right, how many right. false negative we have? How right, many right, right, right. assassins are in the, pu sure. in the public scene? Sure. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think that I wouldn't have the balls <laughs> to determine <laughs> what's the correct way to go in order to improve the efficiency of something that I consider to be permitting a prosperous society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I would say that trying to reason more about each individual case would go towards increasing the efficiency from, let's say, 90% to 95% and let's hope to 100% someday. But it's a relative improvement. Sure, sure, sure. I 100% sure. support him. Like yeah, right, right, right. That's a worthy cause to, right. to fight for. Right. But right. we should know what's the absolute. The other side of this absolute in what we have as 90% success, I don't know if it's 90, it could be much lower, it could be much higher, I don't know. I'm just saying it's permitting prosperity. And that's mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. as long as it's doing that, I would consider the alternative to be absolute chaos or, yeah. or the, the opposite of yes. from that. Absolutely. And so I would say that we have to be able to see the, uh, the absolute. And so it's just trying to prove uh, 5%. It's not trying to change the state of black Americans from slavery towards freedom. That's an absolute mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. That's an, it's changing from zero to hundred, mm -hmm. but, this is just a change from 90 to 95. The odds of that investment to be worthy are lower than if you're trying to change something from zero to 100. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you've got much more to gain. That's yeah, why I'm yeah. considering my efforts in neuroscience to be maybe more worth it. Mm. It's also true that there's many super talented people already working in the field. So my contribution might not be as notable. But I think that somewhere where there hasn't been such a big impact in the previous mm. years, which it depends on how you consider it. But it's easier to improve something which is worse than to improve something that it's already relatively good or not as horrible as it could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with that. So there's, you know, looked at from sort of a, a, a perspective where you kind of step back and survey the whole. I think that's certainly true. One of the things, I definitely recommend watching that movie, Just Mercy. There's a book as well. And one of the things that I think, you know, Brian Stevenson does really well is, is in those places we can also, though, from that, that sort of macro level perspective, forget about the, the, the individual stories and the individual lives. And I think that's one of the things that the movie does a really good job of capturing, you know, comes back to our topic of repentance. Uh, rationality. And I want to talk a little bit about grief as well, uh, which got me onto the Brian Stevenson thing. But one of the things that I, I, I think that movie does really well and that can get lost in those sort of macro level looks at things, a bird's eye perspective where we're looking at the, you know, percentages is this particular human being. And this particular human being is as immeasurably valuable. And, um, and the, the, the movie does a really nice job of capturing what it looks like to bring justice into one person's life where there was a hideous unjust that that's then undone. And it looks at another person who, who was executed by the state of Alabama. He was a Vietnam veteran and, um, and just probably belonged more in a hospital rather than a prison and uh, just had a lot of PTSD. And it just looks at the regret that he had. He, he keeps saying, I mean, he said, I did it. I, there's no doubt I did it. I did the thing they said I did. And he's just 
just keep circling back to regret, regret, regret. I think there is a, a moment in the movie where it moves from regret to repentance, perhaps for him, as he's getting ready to be executed and he's talking with Brian Stevenson. And Brian Stevenson just speaks worth into his life. The song that, I'm going to forget the song that he played at his execution, but it's a, it's a song, it's a, the old rug and cross. It's an old classic Christian song uh, about the mercy and the grace of Jesus, which goes to what, what got me started talking. Sorry, this is sort of a long detour, but what got me started in that direction is thinking about the study that I read about people, you, you mentioned the word grief, and there's a study, uh, I can't point you in the direction of it right now, but it was a study looking at people who had lost uh, loved ones, children, parents, brother, sister. They had lost someone like that to something that was horribly unjust. And it was specifically looking at people who had lost loved ones to being murdered. They were, you know, just killed by somebody. And uh, the study showed, um, I thought this was fascinating. And, it, and again, I think it comes back to our point. Um, what the study looked at is, is the people who could somehow, and I don't know how you do this. I, I've thought about this a lot, actually. Like if, if one of my daughters was, say, raped and murdered or something like that, the, the grief that I would feel that would would perhaps tend to harden my heart, tend to make me shrivel up, tend to see my heart going into a lot of really dark places with that. What the study showed is that people who could somehow, somehow actually forgive the person who murdered, and there were some who were ma managed to do this, those people who were actually able to forgive that person as opposed to I remember another movie it's called dead man walking and just the, the, the people who are just wanting to see I, I want to see that guy fry I want to see him dead I want to see him you know just the skin burning on him as he's electrocuted I mean you know and that they they hold on to that bitterness those people never really move out of that circle and the the, the murder and the murderer has a kind of grip on their lives that never really lets go. It's, it's an emotion, uh, but an emotion that's hardened into a very negative form. Even if they inflict a worse consequence to the murderer? Yeah, wanting to inflict, wanting to, wanting to you know, the, the grief is, is hardened into to, to an anger, a, a, a wrath that you must see sort of brought onto that person. And again, what the study showed is people who can let that go somehow. And I think that's almost miraculous. Um, in fact, I would say that, that, that I, th I think that is miraculous. I think that that requires some kind of grace to come into the person's life, to a, a place from out of which they can forgive. Um, that's not natural. I think, you know, if we're, we're speaking strictly biologically, you know, maybe the, the, the thing is to just, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, make sure that, you know, the other person is paying the price or whatever, but rather there's a, a different logic that's tied to our emotions that I think, and I, and I don't think it's irrational again, but somebody who can actually in that place find the ability to forgive all of that anger is lifted off of them. The grief that, that threatens to paralyze them, threatens to harden into a place where they can't feel and they feel like, you know, it just becomes all consuming. The person who can somehow have, find a place to, you know, I forgive you for what you did. That person gets freed up apparently 
to some more fitting emotions, to emotions that release burdens instead of tightening them and and making them heavier and having them start to paralyze. And I think that that's something, again, that you know, no computer is ever going to get even close to something like that. But I think we're so much more than that kind of calculative rationality, that there's a rationality that is responsive to weighing things correctly with what's the significance of this? What's the, and I think emotions are necessarily involved in those moments. And so it's more a fitting of what's uh, more, more a question of what's a fitting emotion, what's a proper emotion, what emotions paralyze, what emotions release that paralysis. I think, I think regret is a type of emotion Remorse, I think, can be a type of emotion that t- tends toward paralysis, tends toward bitterness, uh, tends toward maybe just merely trying to cover your rear end as opposed to relationships being healed. So I think that that's something then that, yeah, I mean, I, I, like, the, I like the direction that that conversation then is going. I like, the, I like that you brought up grief in that because I think that's a really important example of another, of another emotion that can tend to harden to a place where it is irrational, where it is non-functional, where it, it is failing to, or, to, to orient one in a, in a fitting way. Um, you know, there, there's more than just sort of downloading correct beliefs, right? There's fitting and unfitting ways emotionally of ha- inhabiting a situation. And so, yeah, I mean, what, what would be, what would be a place from out of which to forgive when it is just the natural human reaction is not to forgive. Um, I mean, another, another thing. So you, we were talking about marriage. <laughs> you got me started here. So we were talking, you and I were talking about marriage the other day. My wife and I have done a lot of counseling for people. So my wife has got her MA in counseling psychology. She's actually the brains in the family. You should be interviewing her. <laughs> Let's have her. Um, what's that? Let's have her next day. <laughs> there, there we go. She... <laughs> She would say, she would be saying, no, my, she'd be like, my, my husband is an idiot. He's got to just shut up. <laughs> but it is nonetheless true. I mean, she's got a lot on the ball. Um, so, so, I mean, we taught a class back at a, a university where I used to teach that looked at a Christian worldview and everybody, all the freshmen were required to take uh, a version of this class. And some professors, you know, there were a number of different sections that, that students could take. One was like Christianity and in infinity as it is found in mathematics. That was one of the mathematics professors did something with that. Sounded super interesting to me. I would have, I'm like, let me sit in on that class. Um, so it's just sort of like, here's a Christian worldview. What does it mean for, you know, any number of topics? Well, my wife and I, uh, Kirsten and I, we did a version of that class that was, f- uh, uh, faith and learning. And then the subtitle was dating, marriage, and sex. And so we, we talked about that topic and, uh, one of the books we assigned, they can predict with about 80, 81 to 90 percent accuracy before two people get married, how the marriage is going to go. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> it is pretty interesting. So, and, and, and what it's the, the, the title of that book is a lasting promise by Scott Stanley. So Scott Stanley, a lasting promise. And it's based on, if I recall research, that was done at the university of Denver. It was done by, it was just sort of wasn't Christians doing work. It was just sort of secular, you know, psychological research. Scott Stanley was a Christian who was involved in that and was writing, uh, writing about some of the results of that research. And anyway, it's really, it's an interesting book. And it, it talks about the, the basic idea of the research is that marriages go, go right in lots and lots of different ways. There are lots of ways for marriages to go right. But when they go wrong, they tend to fall into the same basic rut. They say, you know, there's, they all go wrong in the same way. They go right in lots of different ways, but when they go wrong, they go wrong by falling into the same basic traps. And the, the basics of it are, you know, 
Every married couple couple will fight. If you get married, you will fight. <laughs> um, that's just the reality. I mean, it's just how it works. And so you, you're, you're working to, you know, kind of get back on the same page. Um, but a lot of things that can feel really, really natural in fighting, like she felt that point, <laughs> like you stick the knife in and twist it a little bit. There are what we called, the, the book doesn't talk about it this way, but we in class, as we we're trying to teach us stuff, talked about four fatal fighting patterns, four basic fighting patterns that can feel really, really natural. Maybe there is some kind of biological basis for them, perhaps. They feel really natural, but they're absolutely destructive of relationships. So escalation is one of them. Withdrawal and pursuit is another one. Negative interpretations. So all these different, you know, fighting patterns that what's are... What's the fourth one? You left uh, me. What's the fourth one? Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. So, so read the book. Read the book. It's a good book. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsten would know, I'm sure. So, uh, but we assign this book in when we do premarital counseling with you know couples who are getting ready to get married, and we've been asked a number of times to help help couples out to just sort of put their marriage on a on a better foundation, a better place, a better chance to succeed. And we've been asked to do that a number of times. And one of the books we assign one is by Tim Keller. It's called The Meaning of Marriage. Since this is going on a podcast, I'll throw out books for people to read. <laughs> the Meaning of Marriage by Tim and Kathy Keller. Strongly recommend it. And then the other one is, again, Scott Stanley, A Lasting Promise. So we assign these books and just try to walk people through. Like These things can feel really natural but they're actually very destructive. You need to find a place, you need, you need to put sort of different emotional pathways in there, different emotional things that you're doing that, that guide your fighting and different strategies for getting out of those ruts. And, and that's again, another place where I think it's not about getting rid of emotion. I think our emotions are damaged. Again, I'm a Christian. I think our emotions are, are deeply damaged by our our fallenness. Uh, I think I think we're made lovers. I think Augustine is exactly right on that. We are made to love. But I think that that is deeply, deeply damaged in us now. And so it's not about getting rid of emotion. It's coming back to more fitting emotion. I would say that, that repentance is very much rational from a place that looks at rationality, again, not just sort of as means end means calculation, but a deeper kind of rationality that is looking for human connections that can never be captured in those kinds of terms. And in those kinds of places, I think something like repentance can be a kind of recognizing that my emotional, my emotional patterns, my emotional resonances, my commitments maybe were wrong, and coming to see these other ones are more valuable and, and I want to rearrange my, my thinking, rearrange my pattern of evaluation in and around something new and different that's more fitting. Again, not in a means end sort of calculative way, but in a coordinating relationships kind of way. And that I think does necessarily actually involve emotion, but fitting emotion. And I think that's part of what they're finding increasingly. People like, I actually never took a class with him, but I went to Wheaton College, which is a fairly prestigious Christian college. It's among Christian colleges. It's probably, probably like the top one in the United States. And uh, Robert C. Roberts was a philosopher out there, and he wrote a lot about emotion. I've read a little bit of his stuff. And after, after having left Wheaton, I really regret not having taken one of his classes. And he influenced a guy who was my mentor out there, really, a guy by the name of Jay Wood, who did a lot of work in epistemology and did, along with other people like Linda Zemski, who is a, a Catholic working in epistemology in the United States, did a lot of work thinking about how emotion actually should shape epistemology, that it's not just something that's really, you know, just merely calculative, but something where fitting emotions are actually crucial to our reasoning. I'm pretty sympathetic with that, with that kind of approach.
I think. It, it makes a lot of sense to me. Things that seem to me to be left out if we just think in more reductive terms. So going back, you know, the situation in which you might feel a huge grief. Feel a huge what? Grief. Grief, yeah. What if I offer you a pill which eliminates all the grief you were feeling in that horrible situation? Would you take it? I think taking it would make me less human. I agree. You know, one, one of my absolute favorite passages in scripture, Isaiah 53, uh, it's in the Old Testament, and it's, it's a passage that the New Testament picks up, applies to Jesus. It's, uh, Christians take it to be, and I think it is, in fact, a prophecy, uh, looking forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of the lines in there, it, it talks about Jesus as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. One of the most basic teachings in Christianity is that Jesus is fully God, yes, but also fully human. And I think that capacity that I think Jesus knew grief more than you, more than me. We talked a little bit last time just about, you know, things that have happened in your life that have been I, I, undoubtedly, I'm sure, very, very hard. And just, I think that's human. And I think the capacity to feel those things is an important capacity. And one that I think Jesus actually I think Jesus, I, I think God, there's a powerful, powerful passage in Alvin Plantinga. I think this might be a warranted Christian belief, but don't quote me um, here as I'm on a podcast. <laughs> Wonderful stuff in Alvin Plantinga about just the capacity of God to grieve. I am not, I mean, there was a, a position in Christian theology where God was thought to be impassive, like not feeling, not given to emotion. I think that's wrong. I, I don't think that that's the Christian God. I think that that's, I think that's a, an alien import out of Aristotle or something like that into Christian theology. Um, that's not God. The way that, that scripture, the, the way that if you take scripture seriously and say, you know, some people are tempted to dismiss that as anthropomorphisms and that kind of stuff. And I disagree. I think they're wrong. No, I think our God does feel deeply. I think that we see that in Jesus. One of my favorite passages in scripture, it's not in the book of John, it's First John, John's epistle, First John. It's uh, the opening line, and it says, that which was from the beginning. And that makes you think of just like, you're out in this stratosphere, like the God who was before all, who was, you know, from the beginning, you're in like Genesis 1, that which was from the beginning, or John 1, 1, you know, in the beginning was the word. I mean, you're thinking like the, the most basic reality that there is. If Christianity is true, it was in the beginning God, not just in the beginning material stuff. And you're, you're in that stratosphere in the opening lines of First John. In the beginning, you know, that which was from the beginning. But then it's the most, I think, breathtaking transform. I mean, if it's true, it changes everything. Because the next words are just breathtaking. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, and it's talking about the Lord Jesus. And John is saying, I saw him, I touched him, I was with him. His tears were salty, you know. Um, there was something that, I mean, it's strongly, strongly emphasizing the physicality, the humanity of Jesus. And I think his capacity to know grief, to feel grief, and the fact that I think that he drank that deeper than any person. It's what gives me hope in the place of hard things in life. And life is hard. Uh, there's a lot of life that sucks. It's a fallen, broken world. But I remember, 
another author that I like. There's, there's a lot of work being done in Christian theology right now on the theme of lament. One of my uh, fellow professors at Taylor, uh, she's working on lament right now. I think doing really fine work there. One of the people, a pastor, who came out to Taylor and spoke there, it's a guy by the name of Mark Vrogop, and he's written a book on lament. And I remember just him being in chapel, and he was talking about Psalm 22. It's a messianic psalm. It's a psalm that Jesus cried of dereliction on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those words that Jesus cried out at, on the cross. You know, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, the, the Aramaic words. Those words come from Psalm 22. And when Mark Vogop was speaking in chapel, he talked about having lost a child. And there again, there are studies that show that's the one loss that people never actually rebound from in terms of like pre and post loss studies, like where somebody was in their level of self-reported happiness pre some tragedy and post some tragedy. In all other cases, it rebounds eventually to that pre-level, except for in the loss of a child. He was in a place of having lost a child. And he just talked about the, the agony, the despair, the grief, something that threatened to paralyze him. And he talked about in the, his very lowest places, the places where he felt most forsaken, most abandoned, most neglected by God, most angry. From those very places, he said he could look down in those places and at the lowest places he could see God himself, God the Son, stooped down lower still. And that, I've never faced loss in those terms. It's one of those things where I wonder, you know, if, if that day comes that I lose a child to any, any number of hideous things that could happen. Would my faith hold? Would my faith hold? If it would. And other questions I ask, would I be paralyzed, emotionally crippled? If not, I think it would be because the same thing that Mark Vrogop talked about, that I could look down from my very lowest spot and see Jesus on the cross stoop down still lower. That God isn't sort of like, you know, looking down from some but he's actually entered into the, the, the worst of the worst of what humanity has to offer and sort of drank it to its last dregs. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. I think that's deeply human. And I think it's something that's deeply valuable. I mean, if, if Christian faith is true, that does in fact offer hope, does in fact offer a place where maybe, okay, I could find a place from which to forgive or find a place where my grief wouldn't paralyze me or like I am I am wrong here and I need not just remorse, I need repentance and to, to really seek that kind of deep change. How do you wrestle with the fact that our capacity to feel grief or any other kind of bad feelings yeah, yeah. or even good ones is not calibrated to perfection in terms of when you see a little girl who's mm -hmm. hungry, mm -hmm. who's starving, mm -hmm. who might die in the few next mm -hmm. days, mm -hmm. you could burn the, the world mm -hmm. for her. You feel that. Mm -hmm. When you see her and her little brother, mm -hmm. the amount of effort or feeling that you feel decreases, doesn't increase. That's irrational. And that only has an evolutionary explanation. It cannot have a religious explanation because I guess that if God existed, he would have calibrated our capacity to feel grief in order to give us the maximum amount of grief possible whenever we're mm -hmm. feeling the maximum amount of tragedy, mm -hmm. which is probably, I can think of the Holocaust, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. many other mm -hmm. genocides that have occurred mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. But whenever... Let's say you are asked to donate 
to give some money to a charity and they show you the picture of this little girl, you say, oh, I will be willing to give a hundred dollars. And they are cool, nice, okay, well, that's not much, but it's a quantity. And then the next day they come and they tell you, hey, it's actually a bit worse than we thought the situation. It's not just the little girl, it's also her brother. And you are like, well, okay, I see that it's actually worse than I thought, but I'm now actually less interested in the night and I'm, I will only offer you 82. Why? We're not calibrated towards evaluating situations with accuracy. I would say with a high degree of imperfection. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. My home for thinking about things like that is going to be Augustinian um, and scriptural. I come at those things saying that a lot of our capacities are stunted, that I think you find, I love the places in the Gospels where Jesus is continually stopping. He's continually allowing himself to be interrupted. He's continually showing compassion when it's very inconvenient when he's exhausted. One of my favorite places in the Gospels is right after the person who probably understood Jesus better than any other human being. I think John the Baptist understood Jesus more than any other human being did during his life. Even John the Baptist uh, sent, sent some of his own followers when John the Baptist was in prison, uh, sent some of his own followers to Jesus and just said, you know, are, are you the one that we should expect or should we be looking for somebody else? And he was filled with doubt about Jesus because Jesus wasn't doing exactly the things that John the Baptist had been expecting him to do. Jesus was a different kind of Messiah than the Jews were expecting. And I think that centers centrally around his compassion compassion again that you see him continually being pulled up short uh, and even in the midst of exhaustion so so the story that I'm that, that, that I love in the Gospels is a story of John the Baptist had just been beheaded uh, just been executed and Jesus is grieving. Jesus is grieving. Again, again, I think the person who understood him better than anybody else had just been killed. In the midst of that, you know, people are clamoring for him, seeking him out. And in the midst of his grief, the midst of feeling, I'm humanly very, very alone. He reaches out and he, he heals, he feeds, he cares, he has compassion. You know, Alex, I do think that um, if you want to see the capacities of human beings, what we're made for, I actually think you look at Jesus. I think that's full humanity. And what you see, even in the most compassionate human apart from him, even at our very best, mixed motives, I know. I will sometimes say to my students, I'm happy when my motives are mixed because at least they got to that level. <laughs> at least they weren't completely screwed up. They at least were mixed. I think that that's very characteristic of, of all human things. And I think it, I, I wouldn't say that that has to have an evolutionary explanation at all. I would say an evolutionary explanation is compatible with a Christian explanation. But I think an evolutionary explanation pulls up too short. And so I look at what goes on with that deficit in compassion and the decreasing amounts of it. It's, it's the rare saint that's a Mother Teresa and just keeps responding and keeps responding and keeps responding. And that's a person in whom I think the Lord has done a lot of work. And there are some who 
are in those directions more, more than me. But I think that's the Lord's kind of work in our lives, is that he does sensitize us. It's not all just evolutionary stuff, but that there is a sensitizing to us, something better than just, again, better than the worst in us that's being pulled out. And that I think you can see concrete examples of that in some people. So, so yeah, I think I would dispute that that's just sort of, uh, you know, that the, the evolution is sort of required by that phenomenon. I would say rather uh, what that looks to me like what is happening there, really good things, really twisted out of shape. But what I think goes missing, if we, if we take the evolutionary, the evolutionary story to be the whole story, which is what I would dispute. What goes missing is is the hope that that's not all there is and that there is reason to shoot for better and that there is hope in the midst of the, the worst things and that there's something that calls us beyond, you know, the, that deadening of our conscience to an increasing sensitivity of our conscience. Uh, I think you see that, for example, in Brian Stevenson in the movie. I'd recommend you read the book, watch the, watch the movie, Just Mercy. It's, there is somebody who I think is not being deadened. And I think his motives are deeply Christian motives of coming alive to in ways that make no evolutionary sense, I think. Actually. Whether whether evolution is the explanation of this or not is not the the principal point. It it was talking about a fact, which I think it is a fact that we we're not a hundred percent capacitated to judging things in a calibrated way. And I would say that somebody I, I believe Jesus was. I think that's full of humanity. And that that failure of being rightly calibrated is not something that, I don't think that that's something that's natural in us. I think that that's something that has fallen in us. I think that that is, that that is, that that, that, that failure is an un, precisely an undoing of our humanity. Rather, that, that, that that failure of calibration is a culpable failure. So you attribute perfection to humanity? Mm. In our design plan, I think, you know, again, for, for, for a Christian, you know, you, you look at Genesis, I was just teaching, teaching about this in class today. Do I attribute perfection to humanity? Absolutely not. I don't know. <laughs> you know, in, in, in what we have now. No, no, not to the realization of humanity, but to the concept of humanity. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, the picture of humanity there, the picture of the creation is good, 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 good. And then immediately after, uh, again, whether it's evolutionarily, however the creation happens, but you find God pronouncing it very good. And I do think that that's actually the original design plan, that there is that, I mean, Augustine talks about it's the very blemish in our nature. It's the very failure of calibration, the kinds of things that you're talk, talking about. It's the blemish in our nature, the wound in our nature that points to, and, and our hatred for that wound, you're, you're sort of railing against that. That's a problem. You recognize that that's a problem. What's the standard there that's sort of driving you to say, that's a problem? You know, you're you're holding up some kind of standard that's measuring that and it's saying that's that shouldn't be. If that's the case, that's a failure on God's part, or it's or it's better. You know, it shouldn't be. And I think that that it's you know Augustine again. It's your recognition of that. It's your knowing. I would say that that is a problem. That is, Augustine would say. It's mourning that blemish, seeing that blemish, realizing that the blemish ought to be healed, recognizing that that wound in our human nature is not right. It ought to be rightly calibrated. It ought to be our compassion 
calls us beyond that 82% or whatever, the $82 or the $100, it calls us way beyond that. And it's precisely that moment, I think, that is that Augustine would say, if I can channel, channel, <laughs> channel Augustine for us here. I think if Augustine were here, you should definitely be talking to him and not me. And I, I think, I think if Augustine were here, he'd be saying, you know, that that's precisely what I'm talking about, Alex. I, I think that that's pointing to how worthy the nature is, how lofty the nature is. It's the very woundedness in that nature that points to how valuable, how precious, how, you know, there's something in you, even as you point out that problem that's saying that shouldn't be, not to be, there's a problem there. And I think that's you speaking from something much, much higher than just mere evolution. But you're recognizing an external standard that you're applying to that. You're saying it ought to live up to this other standard and it doesn't. And you want to attribute that to just sort of, well, evolution just didn't sort of, but the standard that you're bringing, even in making that evaluative judgment, I would say, uh, and I think Augustine would say, is pointing to a loftiness in you and a loftiness that you want to hold human nature to that I would say is is pointing in exactly the right direction. Yeah, there is some standard that we are, are in fact held to. The failure of calibration is exactly that. It is a failure, which again, I think in purely evolutionary terms, you don't really have the capital to make that judgment. And purely, and we're, we're t- not talking theistic evolution, we're talking, you know, so theistic evolution, that's a different story. You know, kind of the, the pure, you know, you know, there is no God, that kind of evolution. I don't think it has the capital to make the kind of judgment that, you know, that you're making there. That failure is a failure. And I think that you're actually responding in precisely in making that in making that judge, judgment. I think you're responding to something much, much deeper. I think something is actually calling to you in that moment and saying, there's something a heck of a lot more, something a heck of a lot more that rightly judges the failure of our calibration, if you will. So we might be miscalibrated in the realization of our acts but we are rightly or more rightly calibrated in our judgment towards the realization of our either instinct or our features. So whenever you are acting and we see a failure, we're able to call for the error and you say, hey, this is a failure. And you, you by developing that judgment, that the thing you're pointing out to is an error, is itself better calibrated than the thing you are doing that is a failure. Yeah, no, I do think that C.S. Lewis, uh, one of my favorite authors, I, I really I read anything by C.S. Lewis. Um, <laughs> it's going to be worth a vale la pena. Uh, <laughs> it'll be it'll be worth the effort. But but you know, C.S. Lewis talks about if the standard by which we measure, the measuring stick with which we measure, is not independent of the thing measured, then we can do no measuring. And I think he's exactly right on that. And I think that's precisely what what you're doing in saying there's a failure of calibration there. It ought to be calibrated in the right way. And I think you're recognizing a standard that's, that's I think in precisely that moment, there's something deeper than just sort of what a Richard Dawkins type of evolution gives you. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, perfectly happy to, to make my stand with uh, Paul in chap- Romans chapter uh, 2, verses 12 through 16. And I think the whole life of Jesus, you know, people like C.S. Lewis, Augustine, Aquinas, those are my guys. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. So I'm, I'm happy to stand within that heritage for sure. I think it's got a lot more resources than a, to deal with a lot more philosophical problems than people give it credit for. There's a lot of, in the United States at least, there's been a real renaissance in Christian philosophy in the last 40 years. Um, Alvin Plantinga, uh, William Alston, Nicholas Walterstorff, 
fantastic philosophers, very gifted. They were, one was at Yale, one was at Notre Dame, one was at Syracuse University. And their work and the work of other people like um, uh, George Mavrotis was another one. I think he was at University of Michigan. And their work just opened up, just sort of breathed new life into Christian philosophy in the United States. And I think there's I think there's more. See Stephen Evans. I recommended one of his books to you the other day. And he's one of the leading Kierkegaard scholars, Kierkegaard, the Dutch would say Kierkegaard. He's one of the leading Kierkegaard scholars in the world and a deeply Christian man, just doing excellent, excellent work. And I, and I, I think there's a lot, a lot more resources in Christianity. I mean, it's, it's easily dismissed until you really start thinking about it and reading it. I agree, but I would attribute that to the trial and error of thousands of people through thousands of years. Mm. They write a paper and they say, hey, does this feel like something that resembles human yeah. values? And then people judge it and say, no, this is bullshit. Mm. So you have still, so you still have thousands of people and thousands of years to recalibrate this in a way to make it perfect mm. or approaching perfection. And so I, I would attribute the Bible hugely correct representation of human nature to that and not to a omniscient entity apart from humanity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly don't deny that there is a process like that. You know, certainly in scripture, God takes, I think, as, as I see it as a Christian, very human people, very flawed people. And you can see their personalities coming out and the things that they write. Um, one of the things that, that that's, <laughs> I was at a civil rights monument and uh, I took a civil rights tour through Taylor University again. And I was at a civil rights monument. Uh, there was something on that monument that was written that was attributed to Martin Luther King Jr. Let justice roll down like a mighty river. Uh, it was as a quote of Martin Luther King Jr. The only thing that they failed to recognize is that the prophet Amos was actually the one who said it. <laughs> So a few years before Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. was it was a a deeply Christian man again in many ways, and you know I I talk about that to say, I mean Amos I don't read Hebrew but my understanding is that the Hebrew is really raw and gritty. He's a shepherd just sort of in the margins of society, just thundering away at the injustice of the entrenched privileged elite all of the injustice that they do. And so it's not, I think, a coincidence that Martin Luther King Jr. found words in the prophet Amos that exactly suited the kind of injustice that he saw and that he wanted to rail against. But I do think you can see in Scripture God taking different people, their personalities, and Scripture building over the course of, of years. In fact, just talking about this today in class, no, I want to see God involved in superintending all of that process where, you know, you're maybe saying, well, you know, it's just a human thing. Um, yeah, I disagree, obviously. And I certainly think, though, that there is a process like that in church history. And I think one of the one of the real problems, at least Christianity, my branch of Christianity in the United States, I'm an evangelical, a Protestant my branch of Christianity way, way too much of the time is like this deep in terms of like, you know, uh, for those of you who might, if you're still with this, this is a long podcast, I'm gesturing with my hand here. It's like not much at all. So the, the knowledge of church history in in my branch of Christianity is is a lot of times really pathetic. And, and I think that deeply impoverishes the church where we aren't aware of like Augustine, Aquinas, Calvin, Luther, Jonathan Edwards, I mean, Karl Barth, just the, the very best of our heritage. One of my master's degrees was church history. And I think you do see that process of people in new situations throughout the history of the church, building on, on one another as they work out what does the fact of Jesus Christ crucified and risen. If that's a truth, as I take it to be, that Jesus 
is the incarnate son of God, Mm -hmm. that he um, lived a sinless life, died an atoning death, was raised again on the third day. I mean, I take those things actually to be fact. I actually think it's not merely a faith. I think there are reasons for that, but that would be another story beyond this podcast. But I'm trying to, I'm actually trying to work on a a book in that uh, regard in regards to reasons for the resurrection. But I think the best of the church's thought through the years is circling back to those same basic truths over and over and over again. What does it mean that people are made in God's image and therefore immeasurably valuable? The best Christian thought circles back to that over and over again. I have a lot of disagreement with probably, you know, many people would say the greatest theologian of the 20th century is Karl Barth. I have a lot of disagreements with Barth in a lot of areas. But I also find a lot of things helpful in his work as well. One of the things that Karl Barth said, he was asked by some, you know, reporter trying to get him to say something really profound. What's the deepest thing you know about God? And, you know, da, da, da. and his answer was a children's song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that was his response. That from what many people, I'm not sure I just quite share this estimation, but many people would say is the greatest theologian of the 20th century. Certainly, I would say the most influential theologian of the 20th century. And I think I think that's something that's characteristic of Christian thought, to circle back to those most basic truths again and again and again and again, because they are, I think, profound mysteries that are inexhaustible in their depths. I think, I think you come back to Jesus Christ crucified and risen, and you find more depth in each generation. There's more, there's more to it than the previous generation understood, and it applies in new ways, not ways that are contradictory to what was before, but in ways that the new situation in the world today calls out new new dimensions of Scripture, new dimensions of the basic truths that Scripture points to, the image of God, God as creator, the incarnation. You know, I'm, I'm looking up behind you, I keep looking up here, and there's a picture of the Last Supper. And, and I think there is inexhaustible mystery in the things right around those days. And the best church thought keeps coming back to those things and keeps coming back to those things. And yes, do we get better through the centuries? Yeah, but I think we're only as good as our starting point. Will you agree with this? Uh, before you go on, catch what I just said there. I think that's really important. Okay. I think we're only as good as our starting point. We're only as good <laughs> as our starting point. I will think about that after the podcast. So you would agree with the quote, The wise of every generation come back to the same truths. Quote. Comes back to those truths, realizes new things that were embedded in those truths that, again, I don't think are contradictory with the old things, but new things that that new applications of those in new situations are called out. I mean, listen, I, I have... A ton of disagreements with Martin Heidegger uh, <laughs> all over the place on a lot of things, including his politics, <laughs> which were jacked up. Um, Too conservative. What? Too conservative. Uh, like Nazi. So, yes. <laughs> so, fascist. Way too conservative. Um <laughs> <laughs> so influential on people like Derrida and, you know, on and on the list goes. I mean, Foucault, I mean, so many people influenced by Heidegger, you know, oftentimes in reaction, but Bill, anyway, retrieving things that are lost was a lot of Heidegger's project. And that can, and I think there's a danger in this, one that, I mean, I think has a, a real thing to re- be resisted you know christian christian thinking about politics can easily devolve easily degenerate into i mean i think there's huge danger in nostalgia nostalgia i think can create 
huge problems in politics. And I think, I think Heidegger fell into that some. But I think there's also some wisdom in, okay, there's something to be retrieved, something that is forgotten that needs to be brought back into the present. And uh, while I disagree with tons of the ways in which Heidegger talked about those things and did those things, so I am not Heideggerian. At the same time, I do like a, another philosopher, his Heidegger's student, uh, Hans Georg Gadamer, has, <laughs> has this wonderful line where he talks about the Enlightenment's prejudice against prejudice itself, like only what's new, only what's scientific, only what's technological. I think Gadamer, again, I have plenty of disagreements with Gadamer, but I think Gadamer has some places where he rightly pushes on a naive belief on the part of many who are caught up in modernity that they have just sort of, they can wear tradition lightly, that they can just sort of transcend all of it by science. <laughs> I would say that tradition is the set of solution to which problems we have forgotten. It's not mine, the quote, obviously. Yeah. It's just something I agree with. Yeah. I think that there are elements that are, of that that are true. Now, that can go into bad directions of just nostalgia, and you know there is something, I think, to progress as well. But sometimes the route to progress is retrieving more basic realities that we've lost hold of. And for a Christian, again, I think that some of those are, are inexhaustible goods found in things like the incarnation and the resurrection. The fact that, you know, I mean, uh, I think that, that, again, the very best of Christian political thinking, the very best of Christian uh, ethical thinking, the very best of Christian theology is things that, that go back to you know, things like Genesis 1-1. Yeah, you know, Alex, I think you're, you're made in the image of God. And that there are certain ways that it would just be, you know, fundamentally wrong for anybody to treat you. That movie, Just Mercy, on the basis of deeply Christian motives, somebody like Martin Luther King Jr., somebody like William Wilberforce, the English reformer who helped abolish slavery in the, in the UK, a deeply, deeply Christian man the abolitionist movement in the United States against slavery. Those kinds of, th those people, it was Christians who led the way in that area. People who continue to struggle. Again, that movie, Just Mercy. You find those people motivated deeply and courageously by things like, no, that person on death row has dignity. They're actually made in God's own image and they're still worth something. It's a really powerful moment in that movie where it's, you know, you're still worth something. You are not to be just discarded. So even, even when having free will, when accepting the thesis that says that free will exists, you are still considering every, someone who has committed a horrific crime worthy of living. Let me put it this way worthy of redemption. Yes, absolutely. This isn't saying word one about, you know, should the death penalty be abolished or not abolished? That's again, another topic for another podcast. What I would say is that there, yes, they still have worth. They still have dignity. They're still worthy of redemption. And that circles around, you know, full circle to the kinds of things we were talking about. I think that seeing that worth, seeing that value is a key to things like being able to forgive in a way that keeps grief from consuming you. To say, I've not walked in that person's shoes. I don't know exactly what happened to them. You know, like that Vietnam vet who was executed by the state of Alabama. How would it be going for me if I grew up discriminated against over at Vietnam, PTSD? 
But that's taking free will out of him. I don't think necessarily. It's shaping a lot of what he does, but I don't think, you know, there, there's, there's a difference between being influenced and being determined. I think those things influence and make it understandable, but I think all sorts of things along the way influence kind of the character that we have, that we start to become, and that those free choices multiply along the way. Maybe it's reactions to somebody being racist toward you and you let it embitter you instead of forgiving. You let it, you know, I mean, all sorts of choices that you face along the way that shape your character. Let's wrap up. What's, yeah, yeah, yeah. What would you say is the conclusion <laughs> of what we came with? <laughs> what would you say with is the conclusion? I would say that the conclusion in terms of, you know, the question for me, what I would argue with this is that yes, repentance is rational. In some cases. Yes. Um, and furthermore, I, I would go, this is would be to open up a whole new can of worms. I would say that, that furthermore, I would say that everybody needs to repent and that re repentance is rational for all people at some really fundamental places in their character that need healing, need recalibration was a word that you used mm -hmm. that repentance is central to that kind of recalibration that you, as you were applying that standard and saying, yeah, this is a standard that repentance is a recognition of that kind of a standard, the rightness of that standard, the correctness of that standard to judge me and to have my mind starting to be recalibrated. That's a good word. I like that word. Recalibrated, redone, remade, reborn. And that that's something that all of us need. I think it's something that's available to all of us. And I would say that repentance is going to be in some really fundamental ways bound up with that standard, which I would want to tie to God's own triune love. And that repentance, this kind of recalibration, is also going to require grace poured into our lives. I don't think it's something we can necessarily bootstrap ourselves into, uh, just sort of gin up on our own, make, you know, sort of talk ourselves into it. But yeah, absolutely rational um, in a human sense of making us more human, uh, more flourishing, better emotionally calibrated to live in a world that is horribly unjust at many places. And where, I mean, one of the fundamental Christian things is to say, I myself participate in that injustice. And so I there participate in a universal human need to repent, to have my mind recalibrated, remade, so that maybe I am seeing more of each person, each moment and saying, what can I, what should I be doing? I guess that's maybe how I would summarize it. Hmm. Okay. I think that it, it was perfect. <laughs> Thanks so much. I appreciate just I appreciate the questions. I love that question. I saw that and I thought, that's really interesting. I haven't thought a whole lot about that. Is it rational? So thanks for the opportunity to be on here and talk. It was fun questions and uh, I appreciated you uh, just asking the questions and listening. So thanks for that. I appreciate you having yeah, yeah. on my podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely happy to be here. So.